Hello and welcome to Mayo Matters on Irish TV. Now last week on the programme I got the opportunity to explore the Bangor Trail and hike the Wild Nathan Project in the Ballycroy National Park. And while I was there I also discovered some other attractions in the area. Susan Callaghan showed me along the Claggan Mountain Boardwalk and I also popped into the Visitor Centre to find out more about the area. Here's how I got on. We're here at Claggan Mountain, which is a, like a small satellite of Ballycroy National Park. Ballycroy National Park itself, the main heart of the park, which is about 11,000 hectares, is in the distance that away. It's east and it comprises mainly of upland mountain area with heath and then a lowland area of blanket bog, um, known as the Owen Duff Blanket Bog, which is a very important site uh, for conservation. Claggan Mountain, where we are at the moment, is also blanket bog, but it actually stretches down onto the shoreline, which is quite a unique habitat itself. Um, but it's a satellite, it's, it's a separate site to the main body of the park. And what we wanted to do here was develop um, access for the general public, because Ballycroy National Park, the main centre, is quite inaccessible. The Bangor Trail is on, the only real access trail into the heart of, of, the, of the park itself. So we needed to develop something that was accessible for all, all people, for, tour, for tourists and for local people. So the idea behind the boardwalk here is that it's multi-accessible, for want of a better word. It's buggy friendly and wheelchair friendly. Um, at the moment we've developed about 500 metres of it and we hope to do, do another 500 metres this year and include interpretation panels. So it'll be um, the guts of one kilometre for people to, to enjoy. Um, then at the end of the boardwalk, there's going to be a small section where you can walk down onto the shoreline, which will be for people who, for able-bodied people. And then you can walk back along the, the, the shoreline, which is a stony shoreline, but quite accessible. Um, and it's a very, very interesting site. Well, we purchased this land five, six years ago, maybe a little bit more than that. Um, and it sat here for a while and it was lovely. It's just really interesting. It's the only part of the, the, the National Park where there is shoreline. Um, and here in, in County Mayo, it's one of the only places really where you have blanket bog going straight down onto the shore and where the bog has been eroded by the shoreline. And you, the bog is also influenced by salt spray. So you get very specialist plants living here. And the plants that grow on the blanket bog, they, they don't get their nutrients from the soil because the soil itself, which is peat, is very nutrient poor. So there's not much food in it for plants. So what plants often have to do um, in the bog is get their nutrients from the rainwater that comes down. So that's where they, 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 they take their energy from. And also some plants eat insects which is also very innovative and adaptive to, to the environment. So we have a few different species of a plant called sundew, which traps insects. It's like a little Venus flytrap that traps insects and closes over and then digests them. Um, butterwort is another species that we get, that we can see. And then there's some other plant species that you get in ponds, in, in, in bog ponds, bog pools called bladderwort. So they're just some of the examples of the really interesting types of plants that you can see if you look closely. Okay, so Sue, so we're just coming up to the piece of bog now. Can you tell me a bit more about it and its formation here? Yeah, as you can see here, this area would have been cut in the past. It would have been cut for fuel, for, for, um, for burning. Um, it's an example, I suppose, of how our landscape has been modified and changed so much over time. This area isn't cut anymore and it will recover quite, quite easily um, within the next 10 years or so. Um, but turf cutting does drain the bogs and can change the, the hydrology of a bog because it's quite a sensitive habitat and it needs to retain its water. So when you cut into the bank like this, it'll drain the water off the bog. So it does damage bogs and that's why turf cutting can be quite a, an emotive issue for some people when it's, it's stopped in some conservation areas. Well, behind us here, we have this lovely little plant. This is called uh, bog myrtle, and if you if you smell it, you yeah, it's really lovely, lovely smell, isn't smell. it? Yeah. So this would have been used by people in the past. A lot of the plants and uh, plants would have been used by people uh, in their everyday lives. So this would have been used um, as an insect repellent, and we were brought into the house to try and repel insects. But it's also a beautiful smell. So I just want to show you as well um, with regards to land use and, and changes um, in the 
early or the late 1700s, a lot of, uh, of the big country houses, they would have used, planted a plant called rhod rhododendron ponticum, which is a, a type of plant, a rhododendron, that a lot of people ha would have in their garden. But the one there's loads of different species, and this particular species is really invasive. Um, and by invasive, I mean that it seeds quite easily. So people would have planted it in their gardens, and uh, people in the bigger estates would have planted it as a cover for game, for game birds. But what happened then was it then reseeded, went to flower, it has a beautiful big pink flower in early June and goes to seed and then seeds quite easily then in the, in the bogland habitat. So I'll just show you here one yep. example of rhododendron that we've, uh, within the National Park, we, we um, try and eradicate the rhododendron by cutting it, um, notching it and putting a herbicide into it. And that kills the plant itself and it goes down into the root and it dies in situ. Um, the reason why we need, to, we need to eradicate it is because it's so invasive and it's spreading. It's one of the biggest threats to, to blanket bogs in the west of Ireland. It's spreading everywhere and when it, it spreads, it's, it's a big bushy plant. Nothing can grow underneath it and it changes the, the, the soil composition, the, the chemistry of the soil. So it's a real problem for us. So within the National Park every year we do um, a certain amount of control. So we go into sites, cut, cut and notch, it's called, notch and spray it's called, um, and try and control them. So you can see here this, this has worked has really well. Treated, yeah. yeah, it's so treated and it's died back. So, you know, at first glance when you're here in our bogs, you might not think as much happened or people might not think as much to see, but you've really, you know, opened my eyes to show there's so much wildlife and interest in things and habitats here in our bog lands for people to explore for themselves. So we might head back to the visitor centre now to find out a bit more. Great, okay. I continued my journey to the Ballycroy National Park Visitor Centre where I spoke to head guide Breed Calhoun, who took me on a tour of the centre and gave me some more information about the area. My name is Breach and I'm head guide here at Ballycroy National Park and my job involves a lot of dealing with the public, education and I suppose trying to promote the National Park as a whole. Here at the Visitor Centre we have a really nice free exhibition and it tells a lot about the wildlife of the National Park, also a lot about the history of the local area and local people and then a little bit as well about the story of how bogs are formed and also a really nice uh, photographic exhibition about whaling stations that were in North Mayo around the Inishkay Islands and on the Mullet Peninsula. Welcome back to Mayo Matters. Now in the programme we're going to feature some fantastic young Irish dancers because recently we headed into the TF Hotel in Castlebar for the Come On Rink in World Open Dance Championships. Delighted to welcome the World Championships in here to Castlebar. It's great for our county and our town and for people to come and see Mayo and to promote the county in itself, to promote it from the point of view of people who stay on for their holidays, etc. Well, the organisation was established in 1981, so we're in operation approximately 33 years now. Um, as an organisation, we're continually growing. We're an open platform organisation which encourages um, dancers from all different organisations uh, to participate in our competitions where their competition rules permit. <laughs> So our All-Ireland Championships cater for all grades and all levels of dancer, whereas the World Championships cater for our top dancers, which is our Orth and Craveground dancers, which is our Open and Championship level dancers. So um, the Championships at Orgrod and Craveground level attract the top creme de la creme in Common Rink and Ashunta. So I suppose everybody wishes to be here to compete for the coveted title, which is the World Open Champion. I started Irish dancing before I can even remember because my sister was an Irish dancer so I came along to the classes when I was really young and just watched and so I was nearly dancing before I could walk so it's always been in my blood. 
I moved to the States from Carrick and Shannon at the age of five and I danced over there for many years and then when I decided to qualify as a teacher I came upon Kamarinka Nashunta and it was the best fit for me. We have a big class in Pennsylvania, I have about 100 dancers in my school and we compete here in Ireland every year at the Irish Open Championships and the World Championships. From figures to teams and solos we have, like I said, from the under nines on up, the standard has been exceptional this weekend. Dancers, in fairness, put in huge work. They train the same as anybody involved in a sport, just like an athlete. They attend classes three to four nights a week. Um, outside of class, a lot of them, well, the older dancers in particular, would be doing a lot of core work, stamina building, muscle protection, watching their food to make sure that the right food's taken, coming into the build-up of a big competition, just, just like any other athlete. From our own point of view, our girls have been very lucky. We've danced in at least seven or eight countries now around the continent and America. So they get to travel, they're always meeting new people, they're going to see new places, you know, so it's good, it's good. Sometimes it gets a negative um, vibe at times with, sometimes with, you know, the glam side of it. But that's only one side of it. And I think once people have their heart in the actual dancing, that's where your, your roots lie and that's where you go. <laughs> Once the competition is over, everybody is good friends, everybody cheers everybody else on. We work hard and we treat each other the way we want to be treated. There's a great camaraderie among our dancers. They all cheer for each other and root for each other and support each other, even though they're competing against each other. It means so much because I've worked so hard since I can't even remember. And um, you're just really aiming for this title. And to have it now is just a dream come true. Please give a huge welcome to our winner of the World Open Championship 2014 under 11, number four, Anna Frio. And the winning teacher from Tina Rockwell and Miss Kim Woods. We hope that this, the likes of hosting this event such as this, that we will increase our membership abroad because we can offer dancers and, and other teachers within the organisation and other organisations looking on a world stage. So we hope to promote that and push it into the future. Well done to all the participants and congratulations to all the dancers who achieved success in the World Dancing Championships. Now for our final feature tonight we're going to the Cascourt Hotel in Westport because earlier this month Ashley headed along to the Midsummer Night Gala concert in aid of Mayor Scammon Hospice. I thought about what I had to say, I struggled just to make a plain yes. Shook it up and then I shook it down again, I hope you like it. It's the best that I can So joining me now is Noreen Gannon, the organiser of tonight's event, Voices from Beyond the Wood. And Noreen, can you describe to us um, about tonight's event and what is taking place? Uh, we have a gala night here um, and there's many artists from all over the county and we're very fortunate to have Charlie McGettigan. We have um, a choir whereby everybody in the choir they're all cancer survivors, which, which is truly amazing. We have the Akil Pipe Band. We have a great variety, um, so there's a mixture for the concert. There's something to suit everybody, you know. And Charlie McGettigan, he's going to be officially launching tonight's he's event. He's launching the CD. It's really fabulous. Can you tell me about your own experience uh, with the hospice? Uh, my own experience, my own journey, I'd say itself started about 14 years ago 
Uh, I was very young at the time when I was first diagnosed with cancer. Uh, I had breast cancer and I had a lumpectomy at the time. And uh, three years before that I had lost my dad through cancer. So when dad died I really took up the whole notion of uh, doing fundraising for cancer and the hospice because they were so good to dad. So when I was diagnosed myself in 2003, do you know, it was an awful blow. After that, I had eight weeks in St. Luke's and I met so many wonderful people through the whole thing. In the last 10 or 13 years, my journey with cancer has been very difficult because in 2010, it came back again and I had a mastectomy. The whole thing was, it was mind blowing to be honest with you, to know, and you were just thrown into a deep, deep shock, to be honest. And for anybody having to lose that part of their body, it's, it's, it's a great struggle. Even today, as I'm talking to you, I find it a great struggle. You know, you just feel you're less than a woman because you lose that particular part of your, your body, your breast, you know. But just to say that the people who have, I have met on the road to cancer have been really, really wonderful people. I've known people to get out of their sick beds to go fundraising for the betterment of services in Mayo, Ashland, you know. And we need more. We need more services for people with cancer.